Okay, so hello and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second day of this planetary web of life. And uh, Dr. Radha Gopalan is with us. Yesterday, she has presented this systems view, which was well appreciated and taken by the participants. There were also a plethora of questions that she has answered. Hopefully, the same engagement is going to continue. And uh, on behalf of Lama Khan, I welcome Dr. Radha Gopalan to the second day's lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over the stage to her. So she's going to speak uh, on the second day. Uh, the topic is our food web. It's over to you. Thank you. All right. So it's lovely to see all of you back again, um, several of you from yesterday. So let's sort of uh, take off from where we uh, you know, stopped yesterday. And for those of you who are joining today, we just laid out a framework and uh, like i said yesterday this is not so much um, you know sort of me giving a lecture in as much as um, i'm just attempting to put out some ideas um, some questions and for us to think about it collectively right and to really sort of look at this whole issue of um, you know whether it is uh, any of the planetary challenges that we're facing today and have been facing for a while, uh, you know, can we begin to look at it a little differently? Because clearly what we've been doing for so long um, has led us to where we are today, right? Uh, now, using that systems view framework, uh, we are going to look at our food web today. And uh, I'm going to just share a few thoughts and then we will, uh, you know, begin our dialogue and discussion or whatever we want to call it. Um, like I said yesterday, there are no solutions, there are no answers really, but it's more of an opportunity for us to uh, view life with a different perspective. So let's get going with our food web today, right? And we're going to start with a very simple question. You know, um, you know, where does my food come from? How does it get from the field to my fingers? And that's that's a good place to start because yesterday in one of the discussions, you know, all of us talked about how it can be very overwhelming, uh, this complex relationship network that exists on the planet. It can be very overwhelming to think that we have to understand all of this before we can even begin to, you know, contribute to creating a difference or bring about any kind of transformation, moving away towards a more, uh, towards, a, towards a planet that is definitely more balanced uh, that uh, can sustain life, right? So it can be very overwhelming when we look at it in this whole relationship, uh, interconnectedness uh, sort of an approach. So then it's important at this point to sort of break it down, right? And, and let's understand uh, the various elements of it. And then after try and put back the pieces and see how they connect, right? So a good place to start would be the food system, we thought, because uh, it's tangible, we all can relate to it. And it's a big part of our lives, right? So we all know this, that you know everything we eat has a story. So I'm going to start, um, you know, for, for just for purposes of today's discussion, I've just picked two things. One which is very, uh, very significant uh, from an ecological, economic, uh, social, cultural, political, uh, religious, you know, from various uh, sort of perspectives. It's a very, very important part of our food system, and that's milk. Um, so a very simple um, uh, schematic here about how uh, this is just to make sure we're all on the same page. I know pretty much all of you know how uh, milk gets to our homes, but it always helps to sort of get all of us on to the same platform. So we of course have um, you know, the story of milk begins with um, both small dairy farmers and large dairy farmers, uh, countries like India, large parts of Asia actually, and Africa. Small dairy farmers are the backbone of uh, the dairy industry and the dairy sector. So both in rural and urban areas, um, and typically uh, small dairy farmers transport milk. It could be directly to milk vendors who then deliver it to our homes, or uh, small dairy farmers could be pouring milk um, to private milk processors like your Nestle, Britannia, Hudson Heritage, etc., whole host of them. 
But they also, of course, uh, form a large part of the government uh, milk cooperatives, uh, depending on which city you are in. It could be an Amul or an Andhili or an Arvin or a Milma, Mother Dairy, and a whole range of um, other local milk cooperatives. So um, small dairy farmers are very strongly linked to uh, these milk cooperatives, and some of them also pour into the, to, to the private milk processors. The large dairy farmers, uh, both in rural and urban areas, predominantly actually pour in, in, into the private milk processors. Now the arrows are used, if you notice, there are two different colors. The green one denotes fresh raw milk, okay, and the gray one denotes the processed milk, which is made from skimmed milk powder and butter fat, which is, of course, you know this very well, that you know when we buy milk in packets, we get 2% fat or 3% fat. Now no cow or buffalo produces 2% or 3% fat milk. So obviously it has gone through a processing uh, stage. Now, uh, when we directly get it from milk vendors, um, or uh, it's, usually, it is, it's always raw milk, which we then, uh, the processing is then done in our homes or in restaurants, whoever buys it directly from milk vendors. Whereas if you, when it is um, sent to private milk processors from small farmers or large dairy farmers, the milk processors are the ones who, uh, you know, sort of uh, convert it to various products, right? The most basic one being milk. So the raw milk is just most processed to produce skimmed milk powder. All the fat is removed. And then depending upon the kind of milk that is sold, whether it is a 2% or a 3% fat, the butter fat is added to the milk. And that's what we get in our packets. And that can be available with uh, you know, local milk parlors, corner shops, supermarkets, what have you. And then that again comes home, right? And from there, the milk comes to our homes where we use it. Of course, there are. This is becoming rare. It is becoming incredibly rare, particularly in urban areas, is to get, and not just urban areas, in rural areas as well, to get it from your own cow or buffalo, or if your preference is for a goat, to get it from your own animal, right? Which is then directly milked. So that's a very. Uh, there is no. Uh, there is no supply chain per se here. Now, if you notice in the in the slide, there are these small boxes which say T, and those are the points of transportation. Right? Even if it's small farmers going to milk vendors, it has, invariably it gets transported, whether it's by an auto rickshaw or a motorcycle or a cycle, whatever. But some form of transportation is required here. And the reason I put this um, sort of transportation element into this is because we are going to talk about um, you know the milk story in the context of what we are experiencing today and so that's why i thought it's important for us to keep it in our minds that these are the points of transportation also it's important to understand these points of transportation from the perspective of something we were discussing yesterday which was about global warming induced climate change so we'll come back to this a little bit now here I'm going to make an attempt to untangle this milk web that we just saw, right? Now, um, if we look at the milk story, right, it has various threads in it. Now, it's not as straightforward as the um, farmer, you know, sort of milking the animal and providing the milk. There are various events that take place in order for this to happen. Uh, central to this is, of course, land. You have those who, uh, those who have land, their cost of production invariably is lower than those who are landless. Because when you have land, you have the ability to be able to grow some fodder or to be able to grow some form of food for the animal. You do have that option. But when you're landless, then you're completely dependent for everything externally. Right? You have to buy the fodder, you have to buy the feed, and so on. So land is very much a central part of the structural policy threads. And so therefore, policies relating to land, relating to land rights, to land ownership, become very important in this whole process. And also policies, um, reforms around land also become very important. Then there's another structural or a policy thread which would um, deal with globalization, trade, foreign investment. And why is this important? Because increasingly, we have a lot of foreign investment in the dairy industry, we have uh, global players coming into India, uh, you know, either either through joint ventures or through um, in, in the form of some form of foreign direct investment, where they are engaging with local uh, dairy uh, companies or dairy processors, 
And that is also influencing the lives and the livelihoods um, of farmers. It's also influencing the price of milk to consumers. It's also influencing the choices of products that are available to us as consumers. And globalization and trade, which, which all form a part of this particular thread. Because with globalization, our requirements, our choices, our preferences are also being deeply influenced. And India, be, India increasingly integrating into the global market is impacting the procurement price, the price at which people buy, uh, you know, whether it's dairy processors or cooperatives buying milk from the milk producers or the farmers. It's also influencing the price in the market when you have competing players where some have an advantage over the others, right? And then there is, of course, the socio-cultural and political influence, ideological influences as well, because as part of the agricultural cycle of dairying, uh, a very important element of it is what happens to the animal at the end of its productive life, right? The animal, um, once it's, it's not productive for a small farmer particularly, and you know, a huge amount, anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of our milk is produced by small farmers. They are the backbone of our dairy industry. So they can't afford to maintain an animal. They can't afford to feed an animal when it ends, when it enters the end of its productive life. So then they have to sell it in the market. And when it's sold in the market, then it's sold primarily for meat, right? So this is where, uh, you know, the political ideological influences, which all of you are very, very familiar with, with the whole ban on cattle slaughter and its impact on the livelihoods of small farmers. You know, what do they do when they can't dispose, I mean, when they sort of can't sell their animal, when they, when they can't raise capital in order to be able to buy new uh, dairying animals? So that's, so these are some of the threads that are sort of, we were talking about hidden connections, uh, which often we don't see. So this is sort of underlying the whole dairy industry in India. Then there is, of course, the issue of ethics around animal products and consumption. We are informed by that a lot. You know, the, the whole um, idea of veganism and um, which, which informs people's choices and preferences for, um, you know, whether they choose to um, sort of um, consume dairy products or not. So that also, of course, has an impact on the story of milk, particularly in the context of livelihoods of small farmers. There, there is, of course, a special situation with COVID-19 because those teas that I showed you, those were blocked for some time. So when we had the first lockdown and it wasn't very clear what, uh, you know, what was allowed, what was not allowed, um, there was there were severe blockages in these transportations, which then impacted. And many of us have seen these photographs in the newspapers where, you know, farmers were disposing their milk because there was no way to. And, and, I'm, and I live in Kerala. And one of the problems that we had was that uh, the milk was produced here there was surplus milk which had to be then which is typically the, the typical process is it's taken across to Tamil Nadu across the border where it's processed uh, to you know to produce skimmed milk powder and uh, butter fat now when the milk could not be taken across the border because Kerala doesn't have the capacity to process all its raw milk we process some of it but we don't process all of it so when that happened then there was a glut of liquid milk which is a perishable so you know how do you deal with that so there was um, so one of the good things that did happen of course that it was distributed in and provided as a part of the midday meal scheme for, 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 for children who were at home but it was delivered to their homes so uh, but then there was this it, it, it was a, it, it was a fair amount of a crisis because what do you do with perishable items right so again when we think of policies uh, particularly in situations where any way livelihoods have been hit and when you are affected by something like this. So thinking of policies and responding to things like epidemics, one has to also keep these um, understand this understanding in mind. And then there is in, in the whole milk web is the consumer choice, right? Our own influences, our socio-cultural influences, um, you know, our demand for global brands, uh, where our uh, choices and tastes are influenced by um, what is current in various countries. So for example, the flavored yogurt, um, you know, different uh, frozen deserts, right? So there is this huge demand for global brands. And that is pushed significantly by large corporations and agribusinesses, which is which then manifests itself in the form of 
or indirect investment. So there is this whole cycle of you know, choice response to choice. But then the question is, how is our choice influenced? There is this large advertising industry as well, which influences our choices. So you know, do we really have free choice in that sense? And then there's, of course, the big issue of health and nutrition, particularly in a country like India, where malnourishment is a big part. Um, you know, we were talking about the triple burden yesterday, and malnourishment is, is, a, is a huge crisis in the country, as we're all very, very much aware of. So if we're talking about, you know, when we talk about ethics and animal products, you know, how does that relate to the reduction of dietary animal foods, which has been a big demand globally, right? But in a country like India, we actually need to provide more dietary animal foods at, if, for certain sections of society in order to be able to uh, rejuvenate health and nutrition for certain sections of society, particularly women and children, right? Because nutrition is such a critical part of brain development. So, so that, that, and as well as anemia, which is one of our biggest uh, micronutrient deficiency issues in India. Uh, for young women, um, for uh, you know, women in the reproductive age, for lactating mothers, and for young children. So this whole issue of um, you know the dietary animal foods and and how does that play into the dairy industry? And then, like I said earlier as well, uh, our choices do influence livelihoods, right? So now let's move on to another story, which is the story of palm oil, right? Now, uh, palm oil, of course, is, um, you know, has been uh, sort of integrated into our public distribution system, and it is the cheapest oil that's available in the market. But if we were to sort of understand uh, what is happening with the global palm oil production, right, 85% of it comes from Malaysia and Indonesia. And um, that requires um, extensive clearance of tropical rainforests. So if you were to if we were to just quickly go back one step and and look at the situation in India, right? Sixty percent of our edible oil requirement comes from palm oil that is imported, right? Now, if we were to look at some numbers, we find that between two thousand one two thousand eighteen, the palm oil consumption increased by two hundred and thirty percent. Now that's a huge increase, right? And or, and and sixty percent of this is met by import of palm oil. So now, what what does that mean for India's traditional oil seeds? Right? What does it mean for mustard oil, coconut oil, uh, groundnut oil, um, you know, um, and uh, safflower oil, sunflower oil? What does it mean for all of our local nuts and um, oil seeds? You know, what does it mean for that industry? In in a, uh, and related to that, what does it mean for uh, from from a dietary perspective? Because we uh, typically the oils we use are from seeds that are grown locally, right? And that has a nutritional implication because significant part of our nutrition does come from the kind of fat we consume. Right? So there are dietary implications of that. There are health implications of that. There are ecological implications of it because we oil seeds were part of the mixed crop cultivation. They were part of um, the the they were part of an agrobiodiversity. And they still are a part of an agrobiodiversity in the country. So, and they are, and and each of these oil seeds are suited for certain agroecological conditions. So, what does it mean, you know, for all that? So, so, so a policy decision where we're looking at sixty percent of our edible oil coming through import. What does it mean for all of this? What are the impacts that it may have? And of course, very importantly, on livelihoods. Um, local production attempts. Uh, you know, have been made since the 1980s. There are oil seed policies. There is a lot of uh, you know noise that has been made around it, but we're still at a situation where we are importing so much. Now, there were attempts to grow palm oil locally. Uh, there are, but there are geog geographical and climatic constraints to that. And again, there is the other issue of plantation cultivation, right? So when we're talking about diverse oil seed cultivation, we're talking not only about agrobiodiversity, but we're also talking about polycultures where we're growing multiple crops and we're not sort of privileging one uh, you know, uh, kind of oil over another. So now let's look at what is happening with the tropical rainforest, right? So when we have extensive clearance of tropical rainforests, obviously there is a release of greenhouse gases. <clears throat> greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, um, oxides of nitrogen as well, but primarily carbon dioxide here. Not only are the greenhouse gases, uh, you know, sort of released into the environment because the clearance is done by burning, 
but there is also a loss of the carbon that is embedded in the soil. So that is lost as well. And the ability of these forests to hold carbon. So it's a, it's so it's all of these things which are which get impacted and greenhouse gas emissions of course impact global warming and therefore climate change. The other elements associated with this clearance of tropical rainforests is loss of wildlife habitat, and then there was the whole East Asian haze where Singapore experienced this huge haze of um, you know smoke and uh, particulates as a result of the clearance of rainforests in Malaysia and Indonesia through burning, because when you have to clear large scale tropical rainforests, you resort to burning. And this was pushed by large corporations, agribusiness, which is engaged in palm oil cultivation. So you have loss of wildlife habitat, which increases human wildlife contact, because when you clear the habitat, wildlife move away from there in search of food and in search of shelter. And also human beings get closer to wildlife because they are also moving away from the, the, the sort of the edges of the forests have become, you know, are receding further and further. So when this human wildlife contact increases, at one level there are conflicts, there is the man-animal conflict, but there is also the issue of zoonosis, which we talked about yesterday, which is microbial infection jumping from animals, particularly wild animals, to domestic animals and then to humans. And we are seeing an impact of that through what's happening with COVID-19. So this is, this is this very, very complex relationship that emerges from the use of, you know, from, from a, when we privilege one kind of food or one kind of production or one kind of uh, cultivation over uh, one of diversity. So actually, in reality, when we look at the food system, and we talked very briefly about it yesterday, it is a bunch of other systems which are engaging with each other. So we have the economic system, we have the biological system, the political system, and the social system. So the supply, if you will, if you, if you sort of look at it as supply and demand, the supply is coming in from the biological system, from farming, right? where you have inputs into cultivation and the inputs including land, soil, water, all of that going into cultivation. Uh, you, you have uh, nutrients which go into cultivation, you have um, pest control elements which go into cultivation. And then we just talked about the biological systems, right? You have issues when, when we're talking about industrial farming particularly, you have issues associated with animal welfare, you have issues associated with biodiversity, land use change and so on. And then, of course, you have the economic system, which is driving a lot of this form of cultivation, this form of uh, production, actually. And then there is the demand, which emerges from the social system, which is influenced significantly by socio-cultural and the economic system, right? And the, the demand which emerges from the social system also deeply impacts the biological system, some of it which we saw earlier, but also in terms of the waste that is generated from the social system. And then there is the political system, which looks, which is uh, responsible for the kind of policies that we have for our food system and how it impacts every element of this entire uh, network, if you will. Now, if we were to sort of just look back at, um, you know, both the stories that we looked at, whether it was oil or dairy, we find a few things in common, which is that it's increasingly the modern food system is agribusiness and industrial production distribution dominated, right? And like I said earlier, it's um, policies of trade um, are largely, um, you know, governed um, by agribusiness and um, so-called developed countries and economies which are um, where there is a strong relationship between the agribusiness and the political system and the geopolitics, right? And so more often than not, it deeply disadvantages the smaller producers. Right? They are nowhere in the picture, right? And then, like I said earlier, uh, we're talking about dominant political ideologies which privilege some food cultures over others. You know, some, uh, some food cultures are considered superior or more modern over others. And within food cultures, certain kinds of foods are considered taboo and certain other kinds of foods are considered to be 
uh, purer or or uh, you know should be uh, should be sort of um, should be considered superior right and then consumer choice that we talked about now across the food system another thing that's happening is that socio ecological systems are being transformed right it's not just ecological systems anymore right i mean we were talking about ecosystems yesterday but really we all recognize this that there's a very inextricable link between social and ecological systems you can't talk any more about one independently right whether it is land use changes the quality of food that we produce all of it so tightly uh, engaged with each other and then there is and, and this is very important when we talk about socio ecological systems are these three ideas of availability of food the affordability of food and the accessibility and specifically to nutritious foods and this is very critical from an indian perspective right because of all of the things that we've discussed earlier about the nutritional challenges that we face so food is available in plenty i mean we keep reading about and we keep seeing this and we all know this that we are producing more than enough food to feed every person in this country so there is food available what is this kind of food is it is it privileging only certain kinds of grains that is a different question but if you're talking about caloric food yes it's available it's largely available in the form of cereals and only you know three cereals are privileged over others but it's available right so hunger shouldn't be caloric hunger shouldn't be the problem in our country it shouldn't be then there's a the question of affordability so who can afford this food right and that determines your accessibility to nutritious foods because more often than not the majority of our population can only afford the caloric value but they cannot afford the nutrition so therefore accessibility to nutritious food is our biggest challenge right and whether it is under nutrition or over nutrition because even in over nutrition there is this issue of accessibility to nutritious foods but it's not because of affordability it's because of various other reasons right it's because of choice as well now um, at, at the heart of our food system at the heart of this crisis that we are sort of going through is that local cultures local food cultures and the and, and the collective community structures which informed a traditional traditionally diversified food system in the country that has been eroded significantly yeah and the erosion continues so now i want us to quickly shift to two uh, two things that we talked about yesterday as well one is global warming induced climate change where we will look a little more closely at the relationship between industrial food systems and global warming induced climate change so we'll sort of now uh, sort of from a sort of a telescopic view we'll just get down to a microscopic view and let's just look at some numbers here right we've already seen that industrial food systems you know they they are characterized by low agrobiodiversity right we talked about we all know that you know it's rice wheat and maize that are privileged over a whole bunch of other grains which are classified under millets and ironically called uh, you know coarse grains right which are uh, diverse and uh, nutritionally very rich so those have been relegated to the background and it's not just grain right it's also pulses it's oil seeds that we just discussed it's it's vegetables it's fruit it's meats it's it's various things right so there is it's characterized by low agrobiodiversity because the cultivation privileges a certain kind of monoculturalism right and then there's a huge dependence on fossil fuel whether it is for production so whether it is chemical pesticides synthetic pesticides synthetic fertilizers they require fossil fuel because they're petrochemical based right then transportation increased mechanization which is all fossil fuel de dependent and transportation because our food system has become this long supply chain because we're getting food from huge distances right and because of the whole issue of globalization and um, you know uh, the trade issues that we just discussed earlier we also uh, and and also the the point about importing say for example uh, palm oil in large uh, percentages so transportation is is extremely fossil fuel dependent and the kind of transportation that's used so this industrial food system has is contributing a significant amount globally to uh, climate change now if you look at it globally 26% of the greenhouse gases which would be carbon dioxide methane oxides of nitrogen 
26% of that comes from the industrial food system, right? And 50% of the land globally is used for agriculture. So that means only the remaining 50% has forests and urban areas and you know uh, herbs and shrubs and semi-arid kind of vegetation and fresh water. So 50% of it is under agriculture. And if we look at fresh water, so you can see a progression there in the, in the image. 70% of fresh water is withdrawn for agriculture, right? And yesterday we were talking and somebody had a question yesterday about the nitrogen cycle when we discussed it. And I was telling you that, you know, the nitrogen cycle, when it gets imbalanced, it causes eutrophication, which is basically contamination of water bodies with high nitrogen and then phosphorus as well. So we're looking at 78% of our global ocean and fresh water, right? is affected by eutrophication. And then, of course, there's biodiversity. 94% of the mammalian biomass, okay, which excludes human beings, is essentially livestock, right? And the wild mammals, if you look at it, is only the remaining 6%. So this gives us a sense of the relationship between global warming induced climate change and the industrial food system. And there were two things that I was talking about yesterday. One was the Darfur crisis in Sudan and the other was the Syrian crisis, right? The Syrian conflict. Now, when we looked at the Syrian conflict, popular media and, and by and large for most of us, it was a war that was, you know, that was a, it was a civil war and it was because of an oppressive regime, right? But in reality, it actually started with the uh, suffering of uh, people in rural areas. So between, and, and this, there is this beautiful, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, a graphic um, representation of the climate change being the basis of the Syrian conflict or being one of the important factors affecting the Syrian conflict. And I have, a, you know, a link here, which I will send off to Naeem, which he can share, because this is a really beautiful, way to uh, understand um, the, the, the whole Syrian war in the context of climate change. So between 2006 and 2011, 50% of the country was reeling under drought, okay? And, and um, one, of the, one of the causes for this has been, I mean, it, it has been attributed to climate change because it, we, we, we know that climate change is causing a lot of um, extreme weather events. So one of the things, one of the reasons could be because of climate change. And so almost 85% of livestock died. And as a result of this, there was deep conflict, which then triggered into, uh, you know, and, and that conflict then moved to Damascus and then it became a political conflict. So really at the heart of social conflict. So it's not just an ecological issue really. You know, when, you're st when we are stressed for our lives and livelihoods, it immediately manifests itself as civil conflict, right? Now, if we look at the Darfur situation in Sudan, right, this was a conflict between pastoralists and sedentary farmers because artificial boundaries have been created. And this, of course, is a legacy of colonialism, like we've had in India, like we've had in large parts of the country. This is in, in, in Africa, where uh, artificial boundaries that were drawn between countries affected the movement of nomadic pastoralists. So when there were so 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 as a result of these enclosures and these constraints on movement, there was what used to be accommodations and negotiations and arrangements between pastoralists and sedentary farmers traditionally erupted into a conflict of property and encroachment. And so that was one of the reasons actually for the conflict in Darfur as well. Okay, which then, of course, became a political conflict. And we've all sort of seen the humanitarian crisis that it resulted in. So really, if you look at the, the food system, it has a lot to answer for it, you know, from, from the point of view of what is happening uh, to uh, both from an ecological and a social point of view. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through the issue of zoonosis. We covered some of it when we were talking about uh, the oil, um, you know, the, the seed, um, oil seed situation. So here again, um, we, we talked about the structural transformation that has taken place in the industrial food system because of changes in, in the way we, we, we govern, uh, in the governance systems of how natural resources and natural systems are perceived. Um, and, and the whole policies around agribusiness, around livestock, around livelihoods, animal rearing, 
So all of the policies and the structural transformation that has taken place in this in order to accommodate an industrial food system, that has triggered land use changes, which has led to the increased human livestock wildlife contact and which has manifested itself. One of its manifestations is in the form of zoonosis leading to epidemics and pandemics. The industrial food system has also resulted in a huge market transformation, which is really a structural transformation. And that has, you know, the supermarketization, the issue of shelf life. And then there is this battle between the push for supermarkets and increased shelf life versus what are called local fresh or wet markets, right? And wet markets or fresh markets have come up very strongly in this whole uh, issue of COVID-19. But local fresh or wet markets, when, uh, you know, when organized locally, when organized uh, like they are meant to be organized, where there isn't this congestion of wildlife and domestic um, livestock, where small farmers and, um, you know, particularly rural, uh, rural communities, as in the case of China, uh, were pushed to actually breed wild animals because the market transformation had pushed them marginally uh, to, to the margins where their livelihoods in farming and in livestock rearing had completely been impacted by uh, agribusiness so they were they were constantly marginalized and that pushed them towards having to uh, trade in uh, wildlife and that's how some of the wet markets got impacted and so to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and to sort of, you know, relegate all local fresh markets, uh, you know, give them, sort of brand them as sources of zoonosis and epidemics is hugely detrimental to livelihoods of farms. And, uh, you know, in India, of course, uh, many of our biodiverse protected areas recently, as recent as April, May 2020, have been um, either unlocked or preparing to be unlocked for large projects. And, and what its impact is going to be we will all see, but we saw some of it happening in Assam recently with the blowout of the oil wells, right? We will sort of really look at um, a couple of more things before I sort of stop so that we can have a discussion. So one thing I want to leave us with is also that all of these are not one-off events or phenomena, right? They are actually structures. They're actually structural things that are happening. And there are some hidden connections that I want to just throw out there for our discussion, right? When we talk about clearing rainforests. So when, so it's interesting that, you know, when we talk about clearance of rainforests, apart from all the things that we talked about, that, that actually these rainforests, they serve as firewalls, you know? They serve as firewalls between, uh, between ecosystems which have wildlife and uh, human society and, and sort of human uh, habitation. And that's how uh, historically we've been, we, we've sort of not had, while we've had pandemics and epidemics, but these firewalls have been very important in preventing much greater such epidemics from happening. And the rainforests really serve as what are called biotic pumps, which is, you know, they, they release moisture into the air. You have cloud formation from them, but they're also, they also have a very strong cooling effect, which is why, where there are a lot of forests, uh, you, you automatically have a lot more rain because forests release particulates which form nuclei for condensation and that water vapor, when it condens condensates, we, we receive rain. So rainforests not just generate um, you know, a water vapor and as a result cloud formation, but also serve as nuclei for rainfall. Now, what is interesting is the relationship between clearing rainforests, reduction in rainfall and water scarcity. And we're seeing today with COVID-19 that water scarcity is deeply going to impact us in protecting ourselves from the disease. Because one of the things that we have to do constantly is use water to disinfect ourselves, to wash our hands with soap. So water scarcity is significantly affecting protection against a disease which like COVID-19, right? So this whole interrelationship, there are so many layers and connections that we need to understand and unearth. And so it's very, very important to understand the centrality of 
um, ecosystems, intact ecosystems, and, and sort of not just regenerating them, but also preventing the kind of loss that is happening as a result of our modern food systems. So I'm going to um, sort of quickly go through this one, which is which, which is essentially, I just want to point out a couple of things here that, you know, intensive livestock production that we are engaging in, right? It's not only about clearance of forests, but it's also about how the production takes place, right? We're deeply compromising what is being called biosecurity because when you have animals in confined spaces, right, you are allowing for disease transmission to happen. And you're not just narrowing the, you know, not just narrowing the genetic diversity because you're multiplying the same breed and the same, uh, you know, you're literally interbreeding because you want only certain kinds of animals, high milking animals, high animals which have, uh, you're, you're pumping animals with antibiotics and hormones because you want them to produce more meat, right? So the, it's the way of, as opposed to animals being part of our agricultural cycle, and therefore they were part of our food cycle whether we were eating, you know, whether we eat mutton or beef or chicken, when they're part of the agricultural cycle, then you have the genetic diversity, right? So, so these are some things to think about in this whole uh, context of uh, food systems. And of course, climate change, which we've talked about and how we've been sort of really looking at food as a commodity um, where we are even labeling seeds as proprietary and and not letting them not sort of being what they really should be which is they are common pool resources i mean they are seeds are meant to be exchanged and shared and and there's nothing proprietary about life right you can't really appropriate life like that I'm going to skip some of this because we talked a little bit about it yesterday, where we, you know, we were saying that the dominant response has been, uh, you know, symptomatic and uh, sort of uh, it, it has really been about firefighting. So what we're saying at this point is we're saying that a transformation is an imperative, and what we're also saying that it is possible, right? If we begin to really understand these relationships and begin to radically reimagine our food systems, it's very, very possible. As Karen Washington says, uh, you know, when uh, she's an urban agricultural leader in New York, and she, she sort of says, you know, it, the food system is not broken, but it's because it's working like our caste system, which is based on demographics, economics, and race. So if we're really going to transform this food system, right, we have to look at power and structures of power. Who has the power, right? And, and can we take some of that power in a collective fashion? And can we reimagine the way we produce food? So we can go back to the nested systems that we were talking about yesterday and really consider how do we restore those patterns and organizations that we talked about yesterday, the cycles, the rhythms, and, and understand these power structures and see how we can transform some of these power structures. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and not sort of go to the what next slide because that we can do towards the end. And uh, I'm going to sort of get out of the presenting mode and uh, we can throw it open for discussion. I'm sorry, I think I took much more time than I imagined. No, I would. Not at all. You are just in time. Yeah, OK, great. Yeah, so uh, now it's open for uh, people to ask questions or reflect on, on the presentation. Uh, there is one message which Madhureddy has yeah. dropped yeah. at the beginning. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, hi, Madhu. Um, Yes, the world's largest dairy player. And, and I think, I, and also, uh, Madhu, I wanted to, and I'm sure you've read this report on the milk crisis where we, where we talk about, uh, from the Food Sovereignty Alliance, where we talk about this whole issue of the entry of these very large dairy players into the country and extensive, extensive entry. Yeah, absolutely, yes. So Nusair, okay. So this is a very, very important question, I think. So how do we feed urban areas without the industrial food system? That's an interesting point. Now, uh, I think C Cuba has really actually showed us, shown us the way significantly there, Nusair. Um, we're going to talk more about it tomorrow, but I would um, like us to think about, when we talk about transformation, is that there are, there are multiple ways of growing food with 
okay, let me just uh, roll back a little bit and say that an overnight change is unrealistic and impractical. But what we're looking at is we're saying that there are ways, there are humongous numbers of examples of initiatives all over the world and in India where people have shown how it's possible to have a more um, transformed system. Okay. So now, uh, so having said that, it has to be a transition where you have to have both systems. And as one evolves, the other one has to unevolve. Okay. So that is, that's how it has to happen. So your question is, which areas or communities in India are managing to keep their food system sustainable? Now, sustainability is a very, very big question there. And, you know, globally too, it's, it's very, very, uh, the, the, the only example that I can come closest to in terms of an attempt towards sustainability on a large scale at a countrywide is what happened in Cuba. And that was because of the position that they were placed in. I am going to discuss it in great detail tomorrow, uh, Nusair, uh, the Cuban story. But just for your information, in case you're not familiar with the Cuban story, um, the Cuban, mo the, the Cuban uh, model is completely dependent on urban farming and local markets and collective networks so it's so it's interesting that you uh, that you asked this question of and and in india okay there are smaller there are smaller uh, urban peri urban rural uh, connections that are being established whether it is in bangalore or whether it is in um, and more so in rural india actually and there is the there is the whole um, you know organic farmers association of india networks so there are networks which have innumerable examples of um, people of communities where local markets have been created. And I myself have been engaged with communities which have created local markets, but at a more rural town sort of a connection. Okay, but um, it's not in a form, and, and you know, these communities which are doing this kind of work, and Madhu herself has been engaging with um, uh, agrobiodiverse cultivation, I know that. So the thing is that the, 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 structural, uh, the structural barriers are immense. And so in order for us to emerge from these structural barriers, a much greater, stronger movement has to happen. Examples are available um, globally as well. Examples are available. Um, Navdanya is another example of work that's been happening in uh, Uttarakhand. Okay. So the thing is, of course, to overcome these barriers and 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 the and the way forward to overcome these barriers is coming from social movements yeah uh, so nusair has a last question for today no nusair you're most welcome to ask more questions which commercial foods in india use the maximum pesticides or chemicals i'm not sure what you mean by commercial foods but you know there are definitely a lot of um, vegetables etc uh, certain kinds of vegetables particularly things like cauliflower which and then among fruits, grapes, which use a lot of uh, pesticides when they're grown, um, when they're grown commercially. Yes, they are. Um, and I'm not sure what you mean by commercial food. So it would be good to clear that. But meanwhile, let me look at um, some of the other questions. We have interesting ones. And uh, Devika, your thoughts on genetically modified foods and whether they're healthy. Now, that's a minefield that you're opening, Devika. <laughs> So I'm going to lay it out in, in, in sort of uh, multiple ways here. So genetically modified foods, with the, the, the evidence that we have available to date, okay, we need at least 30 years of data to show us its ecological and human health impacts. Okay? But from what we know today and from what we know from the way these genetically modified foods or genetically modified seeds more so are produced, there are many, many issues here. Okay, So when we talk about genetically modified foods, one of the issues, of course, is that there is, um, there is a huge diversity of vegetables, fruit, animals that we already have, whose biodiversity is, going, is likely to be impacted with the release of genetically modified seeds, which produce genetically modified foods. So for example, today, soya, corn are two big examples. And then of course, in India, we've had the whole battle with BT brinjal and then later with GM mustard. 
Now the transgenic, okay, so, so the, when you genetically modify a food, the protein change that happens, we don't know what impact that is likely to have on human beings. That's one, okay? So in the absence of such a situation, a precautionary principle is very important till you get adequate evidence, right? The other thing is, again, genetically modified foods, you go back. Why are you genetically modifying foods? Because you want a certain kind of, of, of crop. You want, a, you want a crop with a certain property, right? So if you want that, you're immediately cutting back on diversity. And we just talked about the problems when you erode biodiversity. When you erode diversity, the resilience of the entire ecosystem is compromised deeply, okay? So I am hoping that answers your question of whether they are healthy because I'm, I'm hoping that this answer addresses that as well, right? But it's this huge area of discussion and I'll be, uh, while I've just sort of touched, you know, some points in it, uh, and of course, the other impact of it is on the social, is the social ecological impact because it affects, because farmers have to buy these seeds. So immediately it demolishes livelihoods as well. Okay, so at many levels, we're talking about human health, we're talking about ecological impact, we're talking about livelihoods and social impacts. So all of these together, uh, there, are, there are issues with genetically modified foods, right? So then, um, okay, Durga, why has our government always been giving palm oil on ration cards? I did not know it was being imported for so long. Because it's very cheap and it is, and it's interesting, no, Durga, it's cheaper to buy that palm oil than to produce it um, within the country. And also the other thing with palm oil is its, it's, it's, it's properties, right? Um, it, it, it is, it's used extensively, not just in, um, you know, in direct consumption, but it's used extensively in everything that we have from cosmetics to Oreo cookies to, um, you know, to everything. It's cheap. It has uh, shelf life uh, properties, which allows it to be used very easily. So that is why it is preferred over many other oils. And because it's cheap, it's um, sold in, uh, through our Russian shops. That's, that's exactly why it's sold. Um, so Madhu's comment is that we need nutrient dense foods, absolute uh, foods and uh, eating more of this. Um, less, of course, we've been eating less dense, less nutritionally dense foods for a very, very, very long time. Um, and also, um, you know, there's this interesting study that has been done of nutrition per acre, uh, you know, measuring, measuring the value of food and the quality of food in terms of nutrition per acre as opposed to yield in hectare, you know, yield per acre or hectare, yield in kilograms or in tons or in quintals per acre. So then if you do that, then a, a, a farm that produces uh, ecologically diverse or agroecologically diverse foods actually has a higher nutritional value than one that produces um, say the same amount of just one crop. Yeah. Um, Devika again. Yeah, buying fresh vegetables from the mandi or buying in bulk from hyper retail stores in malls. Aha, Devika, you've been reading up. <laughs> so see, I would okay. Buying fresh vegetables from the mandi. Think about it, right? When you buy the fresh vegetables from the mandi, the money goes to the person who's sitting there, right? Now that person may not be the farmer themselves, but it is a look. Is it is a livelihood for that person, right? And typically, when you're buying fresh vegetables from the mandi, you are also getting better quality. Not necessary that it may be grown without chemicals. It may be grown with chemicals for sure, but it you're getting it fresher than what you get in a hypermarket or a retail store. The other thing is, when you go to a hypermarket or a retail store, you are contributing. Two, you are, you are contributing to a large uh, agribusiness chain rather than to the smaller uh, livelihood uh, requiring people. And in India, our informal economy really, I mean, the, what, what is called the unorganized or the informal economy is what supports this country. And so there's a whole set of people whose livelihoods come from selling vegetables. And also, it's much more fun, no? I mean, you're going there, you're touching the vegetable, you're having a conversation with somebody. So you're actually engaging with the process of food, isn't it? Um, and then I'll take then another of Devika's and then come back to uh, Margis, yeah? And there are seasonal vegetables available 365 days. How is that possible? That's the industrial food system for you because you can produce it under diverse conditions and you can transport it from anywhere. 
So for example, you're getting watermelons throughout the year because watermelon is grown in some places or it's grown under controlled condition and it's being made available to, uh, to you and me. And, and it's interesting how we've alienated ourselves from um, seasonal because a lot of us don't even know what is seasonal vegetable anymore, right? And so therefore by transportation, we're also again contributing to the fossil fuel consumption process. Margi, I'm curious about how you were able to communicate these complex ideas while teaching in school. <laughs> well, um, I had a whole year. <laughs> That's one thing. But also uh, do it largely through stories and uh, through examples, um, you know, uh, and, put, and, and one really beautiful way to, uh, to sort of uh, that I really have enjoyed is to get children to look at where does my food come from. So you get them to maintain a diary, a food diary of what they eat every day and then ask them to trace back, right? Ask them to sort of break it down and say, okay, where does my food come from? Talk to your parents. What are the ingredients in what you ate today? Where do each of those ingredients come from? How far back do you have to go and buy it? And nine out of 10, they will only be able to go up to the grocery store from which they buy. Then go to the grocery store, talk to them, find out where it comes from. So then, you know, children begin to understand and there are, there are several aha moments for children here. It's, it's a great revelation when they begin to understand under what conditions many of these are produced. Because it then forces them to ask the questions and seek information and maybe engage with people who know some of these things, right? So that is how, um, in fact, that, that, that slide that I showed you of the milk one is actually from my 12th standard uh, when I used to teach in the 12th standard. Yeah. Okay, Anjana, among the topics which are being dropped from the CBSE syllabus right now is also the one on sources of energy. How, if at all, is that going to affect people's understanding of ecosystems and subsequently? Oh, that's huge. I mean, you know, it's quite ridiculous what they're dropping from the CBSE syllabus, right? They're dropping sources of energy, they're dropping citizenship, they're dropping, um, you know, democracy and understanding of it. So, so not just understanding ecosystems, and uh, but also how do you understand food systems if you don't understand these social connections, right? Um, so I'm not sure uh, why this particular thing is being dropped because there is no explanation for why this is happening. No, you're, you're absolutely right to be worried about that, yeah. Um, Nusair, uh, so Anjana, you were saying something? Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Even is that they wanted to uh, not burden students right now. <laughs> that's the, that's the... <laughs> Right, right. So, I mean, it's interesting, no? What is perceived as a burden, right? I mean, how, how is source of energy perceived? I don't know. This is it just flummoxes me, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not at all. No, sir, I like your cautionary preface of 30 years evidence is needed for GMO foods. <laughs> but, well, it's true. I mean, you need, you really need long term. You, re you really do need, I mean, that's what scientists are talking about, that you need... Um, so the precautionary principle is absolutely critical here. Yeah. Yes, that's true, Madhu. A lot of people think that GMO is not yet. Well, um, the other day when I was uh, looking at a Khakra packet, I real, uh, and I saw that that Khakra was fried in cottonseed oil, and um, cottonseed oil comes from cottonseed cakes, as Madhu pointed out, and uh, it's being used extensively for foodstuffs. So it's very much a part of our uh, food cycle. And you know, we're also buying soya, right? I mean. A, a, a lot of the soya, if it's imported particularly, we don't know if it's imported soya, 90, 95%, 95 to 98% of the soya in the world is genetically modified and so uh, and corn as well. So it's very much a part of our food system. And it's interesting that corn is uh, not just used as food directly, right? We're using fructose corn syrup in every possible food item that is processed. So just look at the ingredients of something you buy the next time and you will find fructose, uh, fructose corn syrup as a sweetening agent. And that comes from corn, which like I said, a significant part of it is from um, genetically modified. So Gayatri, yes, you have a question. Is a shorter supply chain of the food produce an answer to sustainability? Or is a decentralized growing system like urban farmers feeding urban areas? I think it's both actually, because when we talk about urban farmers feeding urban areas, uh, see that the thing is that it's not just one thing that's going to work, right? It's got to be a diversity of options that we have to look at, isn't it? 
So a shorter supply chain, definitely we know from COVID-19 that it is a vast, it's these long supply chains that were a problem because when the lockdowns happened all over the world, there were many points where they were blocked. Like for example, uh, I'll give you this example. In India, of course, we've seen it where you know the access to vegetables and fruit and meat and milk became a problem. But globally, uh, the meat industry all over the world came to a standstill because Rosario, which is this port in Argentina, is is the biggest uh, is the port which which sends out the largest amount of soya. Okay, and soya meal is used as feed for cattle all over the world. Okay, so therefore, um, you know, um, you had the United States, you had Europe. But they weren't receiving the soya meal, which meant that they couldn't feed the animals, which means if you don't feed the animals, the meat production gets impacted, right? So the meat industry um, all over the world came to a standstill because of this one port, Rosario. So you're talking about this long supply chain of food, which when it's blocked at various points, it just collapses the entire food system, right? So therefore, Gayatri's question of the shorter supply chain, yes, it makes complete sense. But like I said, it has to be a hybrid of solutions. So I hope that addresses um, your question, Gayatri. And we can always come back to the question again, yeah. Uh, uh, Margi, yes. Yes, I do this uh, food trail with my student. What's in my thali? Oh, that would be super. And then, you know, get them to uh, trail back as far back as they can go. And then you can also drop in uh, information about you know, when they have a roadblock. And that's a great way to get them to understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we are a small number of just 14 of us. So, you know, feel free to just unmute and uh, ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, uh, could you just throw some light on the uh, psychology of food? Because uh, when I was doing my, you know, PhD in organizational behavior, much of that, uh, you know, psychological component goes into consumer psychology. And this whole bunch of ideas that you have to sell and Correct. availability of the food. Yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. So, very, very uh, true. Sorry, yeah, go so ahead. Now. I just want to not at all. So <laughs> I was just, you know, wondering if you could give us some information about how this consumerism is related to the psychology, or there is this huge subject called psychology of food per yes. se. Yes, that is yeah, so the way that, that we eat, and 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 that also results into overnutrition or obesity yes. uh, on one hand and on the other hand we also have malnutrition and starvation that's right I'll, I'll i'll come back to your question because it's very very it's a very critical question because it really determines what we are eating um i'll just finish with nusair he's got this one question about invert sugar yes invert sugar is high fructose corn syrup and this is in all our processed foods nusair absolutely um so coming back and uh, durga yeah durga yes um children attaining puberty earlier than before is there evidence that it's changed yes it is there is evidence uh, of uh, hormone hormonal uh, use in chicken hormonal use in other meats hormonal use in milk yes there is evidence and i can actually uh, probably send you some uh, some references to that durga i will make a note of that and uh, you know put it in the email for naim yeah so naim coming back to your question on psychology of food Yes, it's an absolutely separate branch of study because of what the modern industrial food system has, um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm just writing this down, puberty in children and reference for uh, Durga. So Durga, I'll send, uh, you'll have that for tomorrow. Um, so Naim, yes. So psychology of food, um, because it's about satiation and, and it is so strongly connected to our neurological system. Right, because we eat for uh, you know for satisfaction, but we eat also eat for emotional satisfaction. We also eat for um, uh, we we also eat to be uh, what should I call it uh, in tune with our peers. Right, we eat for so many reasons. We we pick what we eat, not just to uh, satisfy hunger or appetite. Right. We eat. I mean, it's 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 fascinating uh, how how many factors influence what we eat, and in in a very subliminal manner, these messages that we get from advertisements, right? They have yeah. a huge impact on what we choose to eat. 
And whether it is children or adults, you know, I, I mean, uh, because Nusair was talking about invert sugar, I was just thinking there's this other issue, right? I mean, where we talk about 100% natural, right? Sugar free, okay? No, ed no, uh, no uh, uh, synthetic sugars added or something like that, right? So when we when they say 100% natural or 100% organic, I mean, what does it even mean? You know, what does this 100% natural even mean, right? So, so there is so uh, so that is one level. The messaging that we are getting, the messaging we're getting from advertisements, you know, what is good for your health, and also these newspaper snippets, right? And we all know that the food system, the the, the, the agri business and food uh, food corporations, have invested so much in advertisements, so much in research, and whenever you read about something being good for your health, yeah. I would strongly advise that you look, follow the money, as they say. You know, there is always a money trail behind many of these things because they are all paid news items that are put out there. Most of them, okay? Because food is a whole, right? I mean, you eat food. You're not. I mean, I, who of which of us is looking at food as okay? This has got protein. This has got, um, you know, uh, this has got this nutrition, that nutrition. Therefore, I must eat it, right? I mean that's that's such a that's such a sad way of eating food, isn't it? Because food is yeah. an emotional experience, right? <laughs> I mean, so so therefore, you know, we've all been sort of we've been so trained in our heads and indoctrinated at one level to look at food in a very mechanistic fashion. Yeah, certainly. Uh, no, it also reminds me of some of my relatives who lived yeah. in Gulf. Yeah. They yeah. stop drinking water, and yeah. whenever they go to KFC or MACD, they only yeah. have this Coke or Pepsi. Right. So water is replaced by this, you know, huge, you know, uh, beverages. Yeah. 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 It's also stuff. addictive. It's also addictive. Just yeah. like, uh, you know, like Madhu was talking about salt, both salt and sugar are deeply addictive. Right. So therefore, what happens is it perpetuates this cycle. And, and from a neurological perspective, I mean, there's a lot of neurological evidence. You know, there's this tremendous amount of neurological evidence that shows um, this. Uh, and there's this absolutely wonderful book on the psychology of food that I have used uh, a fair bit uh, in some of the research that I've done. And um, that's probably a reference uh, that we can put out there as well. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of work done on the psychology of food, not just through uh, you know advertisements, but also how we respond and how we create habits and also how we bring up our children, right? what our children uh, you know what our children exposed to in their childhood right like for example there is this you know exposing children to refined sugars or salt very early in life right so that actually deeply influences uh, a child's state can and i also, ask yeah yeah sure Anjana, please go ahead yeah yes right uh, so i tried to look up documentaries on meat and the uh -huh. meat yeah, and they were mostly American ones. So yeah, yeah. There yeah. was some. So there was this one documentary called Cowspiracy, which discussed. Oh how yes, Cowspiracy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just wanted you to help me out and explain what the difference between how meat is manufactured there versus here is. Okay, great, great question, Anjana. We, uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Because I could only think of how the beef ban had affected. Uh, the leather industry and i couldn't think yeah. of any other <laughs> right yeah. great and you know uh, anjana i'm very happy to share some material with you um, you know if you can um, sort of put your email down or you can take my email which is just my name actually it is uh, radha.gopalin at gmail.com i can probably just put it in here. and i can send you a lot of um, examples of how you can explain about, about this whole issue of um, you know what um how livestock rearing and meat consumption and all of that happens not just in india but also in uh, very Asian, several asian countries and and in african countries and uh, latin america as well and how the industrial uh, meat system functions right so i'll send you some information for sure i'll, I'll send it across i mean you can just send me your email and, and we can uh, share resources so that can i yeah 
can I ride on Anjana's question about meat? Oh, and, yeah, uh, and, <laughs> yeah, and question this uh, chicken consumption we have and seeing chickens being transported is such an ugly thing. <laughs> so I had a habit that I'd go to the market, look the chicken in the eye and try and get a country chicken which could stand on its own <laughs> before asking it for its sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, but it's become much more difficult now. You know, it is, Nasir, you're absolutely spot on. The chicken industry, I mean, you know, 80% of chicken produced in India is from the broiler industry, 80 to 85, which is a real tragedy because other meats in, in our country, right, whether it's mutton or beef, etc., are part of the livelihood agricultural cycle. We thank God that we still, uh, I mean, I'm really hoping that we don't get there. But uh, uh, pork is also backyard. So, you know, um, the, the chicken situation is just abysmal at the moment. I mean, we've just, and now, of course, there is this big battle that's happening in the WTO where the United States wants to send chicken legs to us, right? I mean, uh, God forbid. Yeah. And when somebody asked me the question yeah. about you know, puberty, lollipops. chicken lollipops, yeah, chicken lollipops. and, and uh, you know, you were, you were asking, you said about uh, the, well, not, not you, somebody else was asking about the uh, puberty issue, you know, like our, yeah. Um, children attaining, Durga was asking about children attaining puberty earlier. Yes, absolutely. And this is because of the, the kind of, um, uh, you know, and both antibiotic and hormonal yep. influences in our meat, you know, and that is, um, yeah, that's a real. So organic and uh, country chicken is healthier, perhaps? Yes, I mean, Nati chicken, definitely, no, because it is not pumped up with, uh, at, at various levels, Nati chicken is uh, healthier because one is of course you know you are um, the, the people who are doing this backyard poultry probably cannot afford to um, and also they're growing it at a much smaller scale right i mean scale is the big thing here right whether yeah. it is uh, meat or milk or vegetables or fruit the moment you start going to scale industrial scale then you have to mass produce when you mass produce you have to maintain uniformity you have to maintain uniformity then it comes down to reducing diversity. That's so how do you get the efficiencies of uh, mass production? Do you get it by uh, closing the loop, perhaps, in feeding the manure back to the other animals and using perhaps fish farming also simultaneously? Exactly. And we have very interesting examples in India itself, right, where you have this, uh, like, for example, the duck and, uh, you know, when we talk about the uh, duck and paddy farming, in, like in Kerala, or prawn and rice farming, right? And all over South Asia, actually, and Southeast Asia, right? And which the United, Na United Nations has recognized as a heritage, um, you know, as, as a global heritage you know, sort of uh, production system. So the, the whole issue of um, integrated farming, as uh, Madhu also was talking about, you know, where, where we have uh, where one thing, and the cycle that you mentioned, Nusair, where the output of one is the input of another, you know, so that whole cyclic process. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday when we were talking about the natural cycles and the restoring of cycles. So again, it comes back to uh, recreating those cycles. And it also comes back to the issue of minimizing external inputs. Okay, yeah, that is, um, that's, that's, uh, that's the point there. So Vignesh, okay, what's a good interval for eating nati chicken? For example, consume once a day, a week, month, year. I am not sure I'm qualified to answer that question, actually. I'm not sure at all. If anybody else wants to take a shot at it, you know, what's a good... It's, it's again, depends. I mean, it's, you know, food and eating is such a big function of our culture and our, and our uh, body type and our, the, the, the point in our life, um, other, other health conditions of the body. So if you look at it, sort of in, in a holistic sort of a way, I hate using that word holistic because it's been bandied around so much, but I'm saying if you look at food as a whole, right, Vignesh, if you're sort of, um, if you're, if, and, 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 and typically I would say, you know, sort of looking at um, how we ate traditionally, right? I mean, where you, have, where, where, where you have a plate that's got everything in it, okay? That's got representation from everything in it, right? A, a typical, a classical traditional meal, right? From wherever you are. So uh, the, the eating of any food is a function of your uh, nutritional status as well. You know? So those overconsumption that we were talking about earlier is because those of us who, know me, who don't need to consume so much are consuming. 
because again we're driven by the psychology of food we're driven we're driven by what we're being told we're told we're told that you know white meat is better than red meat and and, and who says that right and, and who is sort of telling you this white meat is better than red meat for whom i mean red meat is probably much better for somebody who's nutritionally compromised because they need the retinol in red meat they need it for vitamin a production right so you know i mean it is a so this this thing about interval is a very difficult um, it, it's very closely tied to uh, to your own um, uh, health status to your own um, and i would also say to to the way you expend your energy or to your lifestyle to what you're accustomed to culturally as well yeah. Yeah. Yes. since we are we are we are talking about food i mean i also wanted to turn the discussion towards the politics of food as such yes. and we have seen this vigilante groups coming with arms and trying to you know have mob lynching just because somebody is you know eating something so it is none of their business what happens with my platter Correct. Uh, so Correct. would you like to make some comments on you know the veg and non veg and the so called sattvic food versus the Yeah. The Dalit food. Sure, sure, uh, sure. I mean, uh, Naeem, to actually go from your point, a couple of things, right? One that I was referring to in when when we were laying out the points that the politics of food around political ideologies, you no, know, which privilege something over the other, right? That's one part. Yeah. Now, yeah, when we talk mention. about, yeah, but then you know we have to go a little deeper into that, and I'm glad you asked this question because one, of course, is that. Um, from a livelihood social cultural point of view how tightly it is linked to somebody's livelihood and life and therefore food system right so this whole thing about lynching and the whole issue of um, destroying somebody's life and livelihood that's one level right apart from the fact that it's a criminal act the other level is the right to food right if i if i expand on the understanding of right to food it is a human right right and it's a fundamental right too because right to food is very closely linked to the right to life right yeah. so if the right to food is linked to the right to life and if i am being prevented from uh, exercising my right to food for nutritional reasons cultural reasons whatever it is right so it is it is a problem at many levels and um, and 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 so yeah so so that 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 is really and the, and the politics of food of course again it comes back to that issue of power that we were talking about right so so we have handed over power to somebody to dictate to us correct so yeah. it's so again coming back to this issue of uh, of of collectivization and um, you know to to sort of address this whole food system in a different way to not let somebody dictate what you grow how you grow where you grow under what condition you grow and eat right and so um, i mean and thank you for asking this question and a whole bunch of other questions that everybody else has asked because it leads us us very beautifully to the idea of food sovereignty you know yeah. control over our food system and that's what we will talk about much more tomorrow because that is what will build resilience you know our ability to take control of our own food systems in different ways you know all of us may not be able to grow our own food but how do we engage in the process of production distribution consumption how do we build these connections and networks between ourselves so for example the urban peri urban rural connection you know like the, the, it, it's happening in many cities right like for example i know friends who uh, in chennai and in bangalore i know friends who are who, who are who live in urban areas but who volunteer a lot of their time um, to go out and help whenever possible whenever required they have relationships with farmers where they are um, where they where, where, where during the uh, you know harvesting season or during the sowing season when labor is required and because they have some flexibility in their working uh, work environment as well they're able to go out and actually physically engage so that those are certain levels of engagement other levels of engagement are education you know educating our children educating other people on um, on on this whole idea of food you know what does a food what does food mean food is a culture food is a food is a way of life right and to move away from this Uh, appropriation of food that has taken place by uh, various power centers whether it's politicians or agri business so let me see if we've got any other oh yeah, yeah. No, 
uh, Anusair has got something for Vignesh. Vignesh, so I'm sure you're looking at this, that a recent study was done showing that we eat enough to get about 30% protein, extra carbs to balance that. Uh, uh, Vedant, yes, it's sad that hydroponic farming is spreading widely. Do you have some studies that show that vegetables grown in such a way are less nutritious? And why are they less nutritious scientifically? Yes, there is, I mean, a, a lot of studies have been done on hydroponics, but you know, the, the hydroponics, uh, there are just so many varieties and there are so many different techniques in hydroponics, right? I mean, in, in some places, uh, the, you know, the waste from fish farming is being used in hydroponics. So there, there are there is a lot of um, what do you call it? Um, there's a lot of there's a spectrum of what is called hydroponics. Yeah, and um, so apart from nutritious, apart from the nutritional point of view, there is a fundamental problem um, in in not problem. I'd say there's a fundamental question that needs to be raised. Right? I mean, you know, where are you doing hydroponics, and why are you doing hydroponics? Right? Now, water is at such a premium. So therefore, when we talk about uh, using wastewater in the cultivation, uh, treated wastewater, or even uh, you know gray water in the cultivation of um, some things through hydroponics, that's one different story. But then when you're talking about uh, using water that is anyway at a premium for hydroponic farming, then that raises a whole host of other questions. Right? So it's not just from a nutritional point of view, but it's also from an ecological point of view and from a socio-cultural point of view and from a livelihoods point of view as well. Because hydroponics requires certain infrastructure that uh, is not accessible to many people. And when, when you start, um, you know, when you start producing a lot of uh, vegetables or fruit using um, hydroponic uh, forms of uh, cultivation, then what does it do for us, right? There are a lot of, um, you know, so there are a lot of questions that that have to be raised when we're talking about uh, something like hydroponics. Um, Sanjay, okay, from the Facebook stream, okay, Sanjay Gadale, yeah. Is balanced food habit an oxymoron construct in the psychologically driven food consumption in the capitalist society we live in? Well, um, that's an interesting point. Yeah, when we talk about balanced food habit, right? I mean, and, and again, you know, Sanjay, what is this balanced food habit, right? I mean, how are we defining balanced food habit? Because if you talk to different people, you will understand balance as different things. You know, um, you will understand it from a, from purely a nutritional point of view. For others, it's from an ecological point of view. For others, so uh, when we talk about balanced food habit, it's a very uh, it, it, it it becomes almost a complex question unless we define what it means actually. Yeah. Um, isn't the main difference between the veg and non-veg food is the amino bond and the nitrogen atom scientifically? Well, not really, because um, even in, I mean, you're talking about protein, yeah, the protein in pulses, the protein in various other food forms, right, uh, that are that are not animal-based, right? So, uh, yes, protein has, uh, I mean, in, in both cases, there's nitrogen and amino bond, but there is a difference also in uh, micronutrients and precursors to food okay so for example um, in a lot of vegetarian food um, except for some greens and uh, papaya you do have retinol but the amount of retinol that is available in meats you know say for example in beef or in uh, mutton liver uh, retinol which is a precursor to vitamin a and vitamin a deficiency is a big problem in our country okay so meat also has um, you know from a scientific point of view we're looking at there are a number of micronutrients uh, that are different. There are a number of, uh, um, there are nutritional differences between the two. And if you're thinking about it scientifically, um, this is one, one, one example. Uh, the presence of retinol, the presence of uh, vitamins, vitamin B12, thiamine, niacin, right? So yeah, so there are, there are several other differences if you're looking at it from a scientific point of view, yeah. And the complexity of the protein and therefore the, 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 the amino bond in the nitrogen atom, definitely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that also calls for the end of this uh, second yes. day. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. second yes. day of the night school. Yes. This was really, really good. I mean, we, we thoroughly enjoyed uh, the conversation. Yeah. And uh, hopefully tomorrow it's yes. going to be the, uh, the grand finale. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. 
and and tonight i will send you naeem uh, tonight or by tomorrow morning i'll send you some of these links that people have asked for by email and then you can sort of put it in there yeah yeah, I'll put it to that uh, on the Facebook and also on the events description page. So sure. please check out. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Radha, for this oh, second day session. Yeah. Thanks all of you. I mean, this was a fantastic, uh, it's really lovely. Thank you for the very vibrant discussion. Yeah, great. See you all tomorrow then. Yeah, all right. Absolutely. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, thanks, Madhu. Yeah, bye-bye.